Many people have heard of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. These were the subject of the Buddha's first address after becoming enlightened. They rightly form the foundation of Buddhist thought. Fewer people have heard of the Four Sublime States. They naturally follow the Four Noble Truths because they describe how to achieve a divine state of mind that leads to the best possible relations with the world and everyone in it, plus liberation from the cycle of rebirth when your time comes to leave this life. Could there be a more worthy goal in life than this? The Buddha urged people to adopt these sublime states as their habitual state of mind, making them your living space, your abode. The four sublime states are benevolence, compassion, sympathetic happiness, and mental calmness. This video outlines a practical way for you to cultivate these states of mind which have great practical value in how you relate to the world. They engender harmony and goodwill with others and with society as a whole. They act as levelers of social barriers and makes us feel generous towards others as we widen our circle of care to include everyone in the world, not just our immediate family and friends. Love, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity are also known as the immeasurables because they are boundless and all-inclusive. The four states should be applied equally to everyone, and not only to all people, but to all sentient creatures without bias. Towards people, there is no discrimination on the basis of class, culture, religious, sexual orientation, age or any other criteria that people use to categorize the social environment. Towards animals, likewise no discrimination, for example to regard one animal as noble and another a nuisance, or one animal good only for slaughter and another worthy of an honored place in our homes. Daily meditation on the four states is how you can make them second nature, or more properly expressed, your first nature. It will take some time, but will be worth the effort. As the old saying goes, good habits are hard to form but easy to live with. While bad habits are easy to form but hard to live with, in time, they will come to pervade all aspects of your life. The meditative method has two parts, the right direction of thought, and repetitive practice. It is a common sense approach of proceeding from easy to hard. For example, when meditating on loving-kindness, begin by wishing for your own well-being. That should be easy. Then wish for the well-being of your nearest and dearest loved ones, also easy. Then proceed to people you like and respect, then those you merely tolerate, then those you actively dislike or consider an enemy. Proceed through all these people, beginning with yourself, wishing each of them happiness and good health, even your enemies. Your attitude of loving-kindness spreads outwards, like the ripples from a stone cast into a pond. The ripple of benevolent energy inevitably reaches a barrier at the place where your dislike for a person or group makes it difficult for you to feel any benevolence towards them. That is the place where the process goes from being easy to being hard, the place where your current limits are. With repeated practice, the waves of benevolent energy radiating in all directions overwhelm the barriers, washing them away. Repetition is the key to success. In time, you can teach yourself to extend the same loving-kindness as you feel for yourself and your loved ones to everyone in the world, including your enemies or people you do not like. Practice, practice and more practice. With practice, over time, the size and power of the radiating wave of benevolence is such that it reaches all over the world and is stopped by nothing. Your benevolence is boundless, immeasurable. The same method is used in relation to cultivating the other sublime states. Meditations on the Four States The advice offered here is adapted from the original talks given by the Buddha on how to acquire the Four Sublime States through meditation practice. You'll notice it is the same process for each of the Four Sublime States. When one iteration is complete, the cycle begins again. The whole process is repeated many times a day then the following day and so on for weeks, months and years. In this way you become a beacon that radiates loving-kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity to every part of the world, nourishing all sentient creatures equally. This is a state of mind that emulates the divine. 1. Fill your heart with loving-kindness and send it in all directions, first north, then south, then east and west. Your loving-kindness circles the earth and leaves no place untouched. Your heart is filled with loving-kindness for all sentient creatures, equally and without favor. It is abundant and boundless, 
given freely for the benefit of all. 2. Fill your heart with compassion and send it in all directions, first north, then south, then east and west. Your compassion circles the earth and leaves no place untouched. Your heart is filled with compassion for all sentient creatures, equally and without favor. It is abundant and boundless, given freely for the benefit of all. 3. Fill your heart with sympathetic joy and send it in all directions, first north, then south, then east and west. Your sympathetic joy circles the earth and leaves no place untouched. Your heart is filled with sympathetic joy for all sentient creatures, equally and without favor. It is abundant and boundless, given freely for the benefit of all. 4. Fill your heart with equanimity and send it in all directions, first north, then south, then east and west. Your equanimity circles the earth and leaves no place untouched. Your heart is filled with equanimity for all sentient creatures, equally and without favor. It is abundant and boundless, given freely for the benefit of all. The Four Sublime States This part explores the nature of each of the sublime states. Love The love spoken of here is the selfless or unconditional love that has also been called agape by the ancient Greeks. This is the highest expression of love, higher than philos, friendship love, and eros, erotic love. This kind of love wants others to prosper and be happy without wanting to possess them or expecting anything in return. Unconditional love is much the same as the sunshine that nourishes all life. It shines regardless of whether people appreciate its warmth, curses its brightness or ignores it altogether. Sunshine is indeed an emanation of divine love on the physical plane. To love unconditionally, one must transcend the ego, the I. The ego is an aspect of our total self that came into existence hundreds of thousands of years ago to help our ancestors devise survival strategies in a dangerous world. Of course it was selfish, its purpose was to keep us alive when all around was danger. Today, we live in a civilized, law-governed world where much of the danger that previously existed and threatened our survival has long since been legislated away. We do not need the ego to survive now, but the ego wants to survive, and will resist all efforts to diminish it. When you try to transcend it, the ego fights back, determined to preserve its existence. The key is to understand that the ego is a subset of our overall self. It must not be allowed to dominate and define us. We are so much more than our ego. This is a battle that cannot be fought and won in a single day. Once you recognize that the ego is a major impediment to your spiritual growth, your determination to grow can exert a constant pressure on the ego to bring it under control over months and years. It may never disappear altogether and you may not want it to, because if you are living in the world, as opposed to living a cloistered or hermit-like existence, then you still need your ego to help you negotiate your way in the world and get things done. The challenge is to have your ego under the control of your highest self, not to have the ego be in charge of your life where it is certain to make you unhappy. The unconditional love you feel for your child or partner should be extended out into the world to include everyone, even those people you do not like, or who do not like you. Therein lies the challenge. It is easy to altruistically love your baby, not so easy to feel that same love for a stranger on the other side of the world, particularly when that stranger lives in a filthy, far-distant slum where people need their egos to survive. Love should be unconditional, since conditional love creates its own opposite, something you dislike or even hate. Unconditional love extends to all corners of the earth, from the highest mountain to the deepest ocean, the coldest tundra to the hottest desert. There is nowhere that your love does not reach and permeate and nourish. Every creature from the slimy eel-like hagfish feeding on the decomposing corpse of a whale on the bottom of the deep ocean, to the noble eagle soaring high in the sky above a pristine snow-covered mountain, and every creature in between. It is easy to love the eagle, but what about the hagfish, sometimes described by marine biologists as the most disgusting creature in the sea? Unconditional love extends easily to the good and the noble, but it is the low-minded and the bad that are in the greatest need of love. Even in the worst, most evil person resides a spark of divinity that has been all but extinguished by a loveless world. Yet, the near-dead ember of divinity can be fanned back into a flame when the miracle of love comes its way. It is the same spark that resides in us all. 
Can you honestly say that you would not be like them were you to walk a mile in their shoes? The wise person understands this, and does not judge. They are human, just like everyone else, not subhuman. This is what the Buddha exhorts us to remember. It is agape, unconditional love, we want, not eros, erotic love, that burns hot and fast, but dies away quickly leaving us colder and lonelier than we were before. Agape is like a reassuring hand on the shoulder of a frightened person. In their confusion, the person might snarl at the hand, but no offense is taken. We wish only to bring comfort and healing, we do not expect gratitude. Unconditional love has transcended the ego, and from this liberated position, we can see that people's suffering and confusion have been created by their controlling egos. We wish only to ease that suffering by giving them strength without expecting anything in return. Unconditional love is the product of a liberated heart, it is the highest, most sublimely beautiful energy of all, and it leads to the cessation of suffering and enlightenment. It is truly divine, and you are capable of not just experiencing it in your own life, but also to generate vast amounts of it and send it out into the world. Resolve to do this, compassion. It is certainly a fact that suffering exists in the world, the result of attachment to impermanence and delusion. Most people suffer for much of the time. So caught up in our own suffering can we become that we stop noticing the suffering of others. We do not hear their cries of distress. We become deaf to their pleas, and blind to their plight. The selfish ego tells us it is not our problem. We must harden our hearts and isolate ourselves in the cold comfort of our fortress of solitude where the illusion of safety can be maintained. Like Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay, from the outside it is a picturesque fortress, but from the inside it is a prison, a place of isolation and suffering. Only by transcending the ego can we release ourselves from our prison, and having done so then be able to help others end their suffering. Compassion keeps the continual suffering of others vividly present in our minds, even at times when we ourselves are free from suffering. Compassion opens the heart, takes the blindfold from our eyes, and opens our ears to the reality of a profoundly suffering world. This makes our own problems seem small. The Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw said it most eloquently. This is the true joy of life, the being used up for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. Compassion is empathy, the ability to go beyond our narrowly defined egoic self and put ourselves in someone else's skin, or into the minds of groups and communities and nations. We feel their suffering because we have willingly entered their world, and made their suffering our own. We understand their suffering because we know that in countless previous lives, we have been where they are now, have done what they are now doing. Knowing this, we understand and do not judge them. If we do not learn from our experiences, we are doomed to repeat them until we do learn. If we lack compassion now, one day soon we shall find ourselves crying out for it. Better to cultivate it now. The foundation of compassion is when you come to perceive the real causes of suffering, attachment to impermanence, delusional beliefs about the world, and selfish habits. When we see selfish, deluded people, we know that suffering is never far away. When we transcend our own egos and perceive this truth, compassion naturally follows. Compassion is a defense against suffering. By being compassionate, we transcend the state of mind that creates suffering. Noble, serene, understanding, willing to help, empowering, these are the characteristics of true compassion that leads to the cessation of suffering and ultimately to enlightenment. Sympathetic joy. The unevolved mind experiences little true happiness in life. It is trapped in a prison created by the selfish ego which feels itself to be separate from everything else in the world. This is a delusion since in reality everything in the universe is connected to everything else. To perceive yourself as separate is a primary cause of suffering. Enlightenment occurs when you experience a sense of felt connectedness with everything. When you feel happiness yourself, you want to share with everyone, particularly those whose lives are grim and joyless. When you observe happiness in others, you sympathetically share in it with them, being happy that they are happy. Happiness is a noble emotion. It transcends the self and inspires noble thoughts and actions. It is a self-reinforcing feedback loop, 
The happier you make others, the happier you become. This is the essence of sympathetic joy. Let us then make it our mission to bring as much happiness to as many people as possible. Let us do this by showing them how to find that joy within themselves. Their happiness becomes the source of your happiness. True happiness helps you along the path of spiritual growth and the extinction of suffering. It can be achieved through becoming the fullest expression of your human potential, a process known as self-actualization. This is a natural state of happiness, and one that is within the reach of everyone. It comes from having transcended your base nature. This is the kind of happiness that cannot be obtained off the shelf through the acquisition of things. The fleeting gratification in receiving goods or services is not true happiness. That is an illusion created by our global consumer society. Happiness is a great help on the path to enlightenment, it calms the mind and allows us to have insight into spiritual truth that would not be possible with an unhappy mind. Such happiness is attained when you know that you have helped people find happiness through the cessation of suffering, and ultimately enlightenment. This is the nature of sympathetic joy. Equanimity. Equanimity is balance, poise, equilibrium. It is the result the sustained effort needed to reach a level of understanding and insight into your own true nature, plus the self-discipline to avoid activities and ways of thinking that create unrest. Achieving such balance is like tight rope walking. It requires much practice, and careful, moment-by-moment -moment awareness, plus the making of many micro-adjustments as you go along. No one says it is easy. It takes patience, vigilance and sustained effort. When you look at the world around you, notice how everything is cyclic. What is currently strong will become weak, then strong again. What is high becomes low then high. What is bright becomes dark then light. Is this not the pattern of night and day and the pattern of all life? When we succeed, we are happy. When we fail, we are sad. Our emotions follow the pattern of events in lockstep. For many people, life is like a roller coaster ride with many ups and downs. The wise person though looks for ways to smooth out the rises and falls so that they go along steadily. In Taoism, this is known as finding the middle path. Following the middle path means avoiding extremes and always seeking the middle way on our journey through life. The objective is to negotiate the middle ground between opposites or extremes so effectively that no act is followed by a reaction. The net effect is one of neutrality. Finding the middle path means not needing to suffer the consequences of an act. In terms of the doctrine of karma, it means knowing how to avoid bad reactions, or bad karma. Equanimity means living so that we do not swing like a pendulum from one drama to the next, creating disturbances in our lives that get in the way of calm, inner reflection. It is finding the middle path. We are encouraged to sense the world around us directly and to contemplate our impressions deeply. It is wise to not rely too much on the structures and belief systems that have been created by others and put forward as orthodox truth. Such ideologies remove us from a direct experience of life and effectively cut us off from our source of insight. The tranquil mind comes to understand that everything in the universe is in a state of flux, and that the emotional and intellectual structures that we build for ourselves in order to feel secure and understand the world are likewise subject to change by external forces that are largely beyond our control. The challenge is to accept the inevitability of change and not waste our energy trying to prop up these impermanent structures, defending them against criticisms, and convincing others to believe in them so that they might become recognized as permanent truth. Equanimity means finding the middle path and keeping to it so that you are able to arrange your life so that enough peace and tranquility exists in your inner world for the experience of enlightenment to occur. It is like calming the turbulent waves above a coral reef so you can see clearly down into the depths where the coral is revealed in all its beauty. The surface of the water must be calm. A person whose life is chaotic, lurching from one disaster to the next in a constant state of crisis cannot become enlightened because their mind, like the stormy sea, is too turbulent for insight to be possible. With insight, we are able to see the cause and effect linkages that underpin our lives. You come to see that what you thought and did in the past has created your world today. Likewise, what you do today will create your world tomorrow. You become the engineer of your own future. You visualize the future you want, 
then trace back and know what causal actions need to be performed now in order for the future effect to come about. This is how any successful person operates, consciously performing good causal events, karma, now so that good effects occur in the future. You also realize how futile it is to blame others for your situation when it is always within your power to choose which path to take and which action to perform. Giving up your right to choose and letting someone else decide for you is still an act of choice on your part. You still have to take responsibility for the outcomes. Equanimity gives you the insight to see all this. Equanimity helps you to understand that suffering can be instructive because it is the result of something we did in the past and if we can look back and see what that was, we have learned a valuable lesson. If your present suffering helps you to avoid future suffering, it is arguably a good thing. A major impediment to the development of equanimity is the ego or sense of self. The ego destroys equanimity by always being ready to be judge, to claim ownership, to take offense. It stands ready to engage in battle at any moment. Adrenaline flows, making us ready for fight or flight. The ego is after all part of our primitive survival instinct. It did a good job helping our species strategize ways to survive, but now it is getting in the way of higher development. It must be brought under control and contained so that it does not create problems for us on the spiritual path. How does one transcend the ego? By consciously giving up thoughts of possession. Remember that life is suffering due to attachment to impermanence. It is the ego that is attached to the things of this world. The degree of importance that you assign to something is determined by how important it is seen to be to your continued survival. So you transcend the ego by consciously giving up thoughts of possession. Begin with the small, unimportant things and gradually work your way up to the most important things in your life. Ultimately you should have no attachment to anything. Only then will you have true equanimity. Be willing to let it all go. To lose a dollar out of your pocket is nothing. To lose out on that promotion is difficult, but not impossible to accept. To lose your partner or your children is a catastrophe that does not bear thinking about, yet nothing is more certain in life that every person now alive will one day be dead. Is this morbid? No, it is simply a fact. I do not mean to upset people with this statement. If we are to make progress on the spiritual path we must accept the reality, that tomorrow the people and things we hold dear might be gone. When a tornado or hurricane takes your house, and a news reporter is asking you how they feel as you stand there beside the bare concrete slab, you should be able to say, oh well, it was just a house, at least I am still alive. This is not the answer the reporter is hoping for. She is hoping for a woe is me response that viewers can relate to because the mainstream media wants to strengthen people's sense of self, not diminish it. This concludes our exploration of the four sublime states. I hope you found it useful, if not enlightening. See the links in the video description for more information. Thank you.